My name is Dusty and in this video I'm going to give you some insights into how I grew my woodwork page on Instagram from zero to over 170,000 followers. This, this video comes as a result of a lot of questions that I was getting on Instagram from followers that follow me there saying, hey, how did you grow and what did you do and kind of what are your tips and tricks? And so happy to share that. To start this off, I, I debated whether or not to share this next part because I don't want this to be that self-promotional. However, I do believe that context matters. And so I wanna give you kind of a really quick summary of how I ended up on Instagram as a woodworker doing what I do and, and growing it that way. Uh, I grew up as a goat milker near the Panhandle of Alaska. And uh, my only real claim to fame was that when I was 14 years old, I won the Bulkley Valley Fall Fair Goat Milking Championship, which is kind of ridiculous, but that's kind of really all I had going for me. Um, I spent some time uh, after high school living abroad. Uh, I came back and studied economics at the University of Lethbridge. Ended up working as a home builder for a while. I worked in merchant banking. I ended up in Africa working for a while and Honduras. Then I came back to Canada, started a scrap steel business. And in late 2015, when um, commodities went through the floor, I found myself in a pretty desperate circumstance. I was flirting with uh, bankruptcy and had to reinvent myself and do something. So I've always had a, an affinity for and a love for woodwork. And so I started woodworking, started making stuff, went out to trade shows and, and did everything that I could. Um, for the first two years, my wife and I didn't buy ourselves any Christmas presents. Um, we implemented some austerity measures and really focused really hard on, on the business and trying to make it grow. And then a friend of mine said, hey dude, you ought to put your stuff on, on Instagram. And so I started posting things and like most of you, it, you know, had a little bit of success and then, and then a lot of not success and quit and started and quit and started. Um, and I, I got online and started listening to a lot of people. So I went on Facebook and on Instagram and on blogs and things like that, trying to get as much advice as I could about how to, how to do Instagram, how to be successful with it. And, and I use this analogy when I talk to people about it, but I sort of felt like I got into a gymnasium and there was a big room and somebody took a balloon and a bunch of fans and put a balloon up in the air and was kind of blowing it around. And they said, all you gotta do is run over and grab onto the balloon. And that's kind of the secret of going viral and, and having momentum and, and um, having followers and stuff like that and having growth. And as soon as I ran over to grab the balloon, they turned the lights off and all I could here was just everybody you know, yelling and screaming advice at me, but not really knowing what, what I was doing, just sort of like grasping around. And so when I went online to try and find advice from people, what I ended up finding was that a lot of the advice was coming from people that all they do is give advice about um, social media. And, and they're successful at it and they make money at it and mission accomplished, like I'm not critical of them in any way, but what I didn't find was somebody who was a maker or a woodworker who had started at zero and grown it and done something with it. So it was sort of like broadly applicable, but not necessarily industry specific for me. And it's sort of like when, when, you, when you look for advice on, on exercise and how to lose weight, you would much rather take advice from somebody who at one point weighed 700 pounds and then lost it all and ended up at, a, at 180, 150, 200, whatever it is. As opposed to someone who weighs 700 pounds that says, here, let me teach you how to lose weight, but they've never actually done it. Because there's two sides to it. One is the th theoretical, right? Like abide by intermittent fasting or do the keto diet or, do, or whatever the case is. And they tell you about how many calories to re eat and a calorie surplus versus a calorie de deficit and all that. But actually doing it is totally different. Right, like actually going through withdrawal symptoms, actually um, worrying about your body, actually getting up and working through um, soreness, taking ibuprofen, you know, dealing with people who are haters that tell you that you can't do it, dealing with um, even close people to you that believe that you can't do it. And so I would far sooner take advice from someone that actually went through it as opposed to someone that just understands the theory. And so that's what I was looking for online was somebody who had started off as a maker and, and, you know, and made it and made enough money specifically off of selling their stuff on Instagram. And so what I ended up doing was just, I just stopped listening to everybody. I, I just thought, you know what, like you're OCD enough and you understand data analytics enough that just start doing stuff, start posting stuff and start um, compartmentalizing everything, start putting everything into categories and finding out what does and does not create or, or result in a positive or negative correlation between your things. As much as possible, I try to narrow it down to two variables, right? Where you can plot one on an X, X uh, axis and one on a Y axis, and then say, if I do more of this, then it's positive, and if I do more of this, it's negative. And then you basically just keep doing the things that make positive and, and stop doing the things that, that cause a negative correlation. And so, I, I, uh, I, it took me five years to grow from zero to 100,000 followers, and then it took me from September 15th until now, so September, October, November, December, so we're like three, three months or something to grow from 
um, 100 to over 170,000 followers. So I'm at a stage right now where I'm having really incredible growth. Um, and I didn't end up getting any of that growth until I sort of developed a, a, a proper strategy um, that, that you stick to. It's the same thing as exercise. Like, you know, you can start the keto diet and do it for two days and then quit. And then you can start the Atkins diet and do it for two weeks and then quit. And you can start high intensity interval training for a few days and then quit. The results, the best results from any of those programs come with sort of the cumulative effect of long-term dedication to one program. And so what I wanna do is sort of spell out broadly, at first, how I see Instagram, how I see sort of the key components, and then my advice, because my, what happens is my advice for people at different stages of Instagram really depends where they're at in terms of, of growth, where they're at in terms of where they are on the continuum of growth and stuff like that. And so the way that I view Instagram right now is where, the, where three circles intersect. Instagram is a business and what they're trying to get out of, out of their platform. You as a content creator and the content consumers. And, and where the magic happens is right in this area right here where all three of those align, where the interests of all three of those align. And that's where I found if I can create, if I can create and post with, with the right regularity and use the right hashtags and stuff, if I can satisfy some of each one of those circles, that's where the magic happens. That's where you end up with the most growth and that's where, where a lot of um, real cool things happen. And the second visual I want you to think about is sort of this ascending triangle with kind of a bigger a triangle at the beginning. So uh, the, the way that I look at Instagram is when you start, this is sort of the number of followers you have and this is time. And over time, what you're looking for is growth. And the reason that I say that my advice changes depending on where you're at is because the way that you deal with your posts and how you develop a strategy for growth depends on where you're at. So for example, you can see right here that this triangle goes up and then dips off. That's the point at which everybody goes out and sends out all their emails to all their friends on Facebook and their family and stuff like that. And a whole bunch of them, most of them, simply out of an obligation to your friendship, follow you, but, but they're not like real <laughs> followers, right? Like they, they only have a certain value. Your grandma and your aunt, when they follow you, they're supposed to say your stuff is nice. Like they have a familial obligation to tell you that the stuff that you make is nice, but they're not necessarily gonna be buying stuff from you. Where growth happens, where real growth happens, is after that when you start to grow. So everybody gets that first 100, 200, 300, 400 followers based on their family and friends. And then there's a quick drop off. You get real excited because you're like, holy crap, in a few days I got two or 300 followers. Then there's a quick drop off. And the reason is, is because that's artificial. That's not real. Those, those people feel an obligation to following you. You should still do it, right? You should still do it. What I'm trying to say is that when someone here, when your grandma says that your stuff is nice, that's her job. That's what she's supposed to do. Over here, when you start finding somebody new, someone that you have no idea who they are, you've never met them before, and they take time out of their day to come and say that your thing was nice, they wanna buy something, that's real feedback from the, from the market. That's real feedback from it. We need grandmas to tell us our stuff is nice because it gives us a little bit of a pat on the back. Having said that, what you're looking for is this post initial stage growth and, and how you grow. So before I go too much into that side of it, I wanna go each one of these circles and kind of explain broadly what I think or how I categorized it in my head, um, what they're looking for. So Instagram is a business, right? Like Instagram is a business and they're trying to make money, but the way that they make money is they sell advertisements. So what they have to do is attract people to come onto their app and they want people to stay on the app. Now, the thing that's bringing them to the app and the thing that's keeping people on the app is the content creators, is the stuff that's being created. So if you post stuff that keep people on the app and bring people to the app and have a propensity to keep people engaged for a long amount of time so that Instagram can show them more ads, then they're gonna favor you as a content creator. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna organically boost your stuff more than, than it would normally get boosted because you're sort of a, a proven uh, individual. And they look at you based on the frequency of posting. They look at you based on the amount of engagement that you have and the way that you engage with people. Every post that you make is, is one more drop into the bucket that they analyze to develop something around you in terms of how, how they should treat you. You can appeal to Instagram by being a regular, consistent, predictable uh, creator of content that's engaging and, and is not offensive, right? Second thing, is the consumer. 
Now, I want you to like sort of psychoanalyze for a, a second the, what's going on inside of a, a consumer's uh, brain when they, when they come onto the app. A lot of my theories, remember how I said I basically withdrew from all the advice that was out there and just tried to formulate my own opinions. And now the basis of doing that was autobiographical. Like I, I essentially looked at, at content through my own eyes, thinking that I'm a pretty good cross-section of society and that I laugh at some of the same jokes and I like to see the same things. And so hopefully the way that I look at, at things is kind of the same way that other people look at things. And so I would go and look almost in like the third person at stuff and then wonder why I liked it. I would look at certain pictures or videos, the length of videos, um, how bright things were versus not bright, what time of day things were being posted. And I would, I would formulate theories based on that. And, and quite frankly, I think that every one of you can do that. You don't even necessarily need to listen to me. I think that most of you, if you would just stop and autobiographically analyze how you consume um, content, you'll, you'll find the key to a lot of this. And so most people, and, and I, I do this kind of to make people laugh and, and, and kind of because it's real, is that I want you to imagine the consumer when they're on the toilet, right? Because none of us can go to the bathroom anymore without our phone. And we're sitting there and we basically have that time horizon between the time we sit down and the time our legs fall asleep, or if you're a parent, the time your kids come over and harass you to come out. And so you're in a rush, you're kind of isolated, but not really, and you're on there really quickly trying to, to get something. You either wanna laugh, you wanna be motivated, you wanna be inspired. Uh, or you want a little break from reality for a minute. You might be at work and you escape to the bathroom and you've had bad meetings all day and you're sitting there on the can and you're just trying to find something. And so they're there on Instagram and they're flipping up and down and they're quickly in a microsecond analyzing whether something deserves their attention or not. And Instagram's paying attention to it. And so if you can create a picture or a video that makes them during their flipping stop and, and click it to look, you, you win. So if you look at it from that point of view, you're trying to give somebody who's in a rush and whose legs might very quickly fall asleep something to, to catch their eye. So the beginning of your video, the, the, the picture that you post ha has to be engaging. It, you, it has to catch attention or else they're not going to want to. Also, if you spend too much time flexing, that's also going to be a problem on, on Instagram. A, a, people that come onto Instagram or any social media app are looking for a bit of an escape and they might have any number of stresses going on with work, with family, with coronavirus, with the election, with the government, with whatever. If all you do is come and compound their worries and their concerns, then they're very unlikely to stay on the app. They're very unlikely to want to consume more of your product. Right, because the, the reason is, is that most times when people are posting on Facebook and Instagram, it's a fiction. It's, un it's with a filter. It's not real. Like, you get a picture of somebody uh, having a wonderful vacation at Disney, but you didn't see all the screaming and the crying and the yelling and everything that went into it and people put on, on a smile. And there, there's very real senses right now where people are suffering from more depression um, and more anxiety because Facebook and Instagram are making them feel unworthy. So if a lot of your posts are focused around this idea of sort of self-promotion and, and making, making you seem better than you are, then what that ends up doing to somebody who's struggling with that is it makes them feel that they're not that good at life. It makes them feel like they don't have the right vacations or that their job sucks or whatever. And, and that they're not gonna wanna consume your content. I'm not saying don't be real. I'm not saying don't tell people the honest truth, but you know what I'm talking about. You, you can take something and make it more filtered and less real, and you might think that that's doing a lot to make you seem like a whole lot better, but, but from the content consumer's point of view, if they're struggling, which a lot of people are right now, um, it's only gonna make them feel worse. So it's kind of a fine balance between, obviously you want to promote your products, obviously you want to promote um, you want to make money on things. But if you can be a little less abrasive by, by flexing less, then, then they're gonna see you as just sort of another human that, that is trying to make the best of, of life. They're gonna see you as an equal who's doing the best with what, what they've got, as opposed to someone who's living a fiction and then they're gonna feel worse about themselves. So if all you are is just a real guy or a girl that loves their craft and posts pictures of that, 
in a non-flexing way, I think you're going to find a whole lot of traction. Lastly, the content creator, which is, which is you. You have certain objectives, and your objectives are either to make money selling your product or to build a brand or build influence in, in some way. And so if, if, if you took content creator in isolation, then the type of content that you would create would be vastly different than what you do to, to try and appease these two. But like, let's be honest, there's no sense in being on Instagram unless it helps to achieve some of your objectives. You're gonna have a ton of unsolicited advice. You're gonna have people that have nothing better to do than to try and make you feel bad about yourself, who will be hypercritical um, and for some reason derive satisfaction out of trying to make perfect strangers feel bad about themselves. And so there are some negative side to it. It is time consuming. It does take a while, there's no doubt about it. And if you're putting in tons of hours and not getting anything out of it, then you shouldn't be on it. What I'm saying is that if, if you do it right, you won't see results immediately, or at least don't expect results immediately. I've had uh, quite a number of videos go viral now, but you should cast those all aside. I think my most popular was like 42 million views or something like that. Like, it was awesome. It was, it was cool. It was fun and, and you know, getting attention from around the world. Having said that, if you get used to, to, to getting viral videos, everything else becomes substandard. Everything else becomes deflationary and it makes you feel bad. And so there's sort of like a standard um, amount of attention that you can, that you can expect. And, and just like in statistics, you cast out the very high numbers and you cast out the very low numbers and you're looking for that median right in the middle. My, and my strategy has changed over time. Uh, my strategy initially was simply to try and drive attention to the products that I was selling because as I mentioned, I was flirting with bankruptcy and I just really needed to feed my family. And so everything was about good, good photos, good pictures, and some type of call to action to get people to, to, to ask me about that. As time went on and I had more orders than I could handle, um, at that point I just, I just started making stuff that I, that I liked. I just started posting pictures and videos about the process of making projects that I really like. And I hope that, that my genuine passion for woodworking um, was showcased in, in, those, in those pictures. And so then a whole lot more people started following me that were in woodwork and that were in that as a hobby or as a business. And it's cool, you get to meet people from all over the place and I, can, I converse with people from all over the world. And so if, if, you, if you look at every one of your posts through, through that, like am I satisfying uh, somewhat of what Instagram is expecting out of a content creator? Am I hopefully appealing to somebody who's sitting on the toilet madly flicking through trying to find something fun and, and exciting? And am I achieving the objectives for myself as, a, as, a, as an individual simply trying to put food on the table for my family? Okay, so now this has ended up to be probably about the length of the video that I wanna shoot at this point in time, and I think a pretty good general overview of how I view Instagram. Having said that, I do wanna give you some real practical advice that I think everybody needs to start with. The, the iPhone that we're dealing on, I don't, know, I don't know what it is, like however many square inches, like that's the real estate that we're trying to communicate people with. That's the, um, the total amount of, of, of screen that someone's going to be look at. So no matter what you do, you have got to take good pictures and you've got to take good videos. I do everything on an iPhone. I don't have another camera. I edit everything on an iPhone. I don't have any editing software. Uh, that, partly because at that point, all I had was an iPhone and I couldn't afford a new camera. Um, my editing app was free. I now pay, I think, $3.99 a month because they changed their deal. It's Splice. Um, and I think that you can create good content. So I've grown all the way from zero to over 170 with my iPhone. This, this was the, the crappy tripod that I bought off of Instagram that actually I broke and put a wood splint on. When I first started off, I used to duct tape my, my, my phone to a ladder. Like my cost of production were very low. When I got started off, I had very little money. I had a whole lot of time and a whole lot of enthusiasm. And, and um, as I mentioned before, like we, I basically, I, I worked nearly two years without taking a day off. One or two or three, maybe, maybe five, I don't know, in, in the entire year. We didn't go on vacation other than around our house. We didn't have enough money. My wife and I didn't buy each other birthday and Christmas presents. It was just about focusing on the business. I started in my garage as well. I started with crappy budget uh, Ryobi tools from Home Depot because that's all that I could afford. And, and I just started hacking away at it and I, and I stuck with it. I just stuck with it. I, I had no other choice but to do that. And so my, my, my main advice, and this doesn't matter who it's for, you have to be good at content creation and your iPhone is more than enough. Now I have the 11. Um, every time the iPhone does update, that is, that is one thing that I do is I get the new iPhone because, 
because pixels matter. Quality photos are better than grainy photos. Well-lit photos are better than not-lit photos. And so I, I, it's, a, it's an important tool. Probably my most important tool in my whole business is my stupid phone. So um, I, if, you've got, if you've got the resources, don't feel bad about buying yourself a phone and getting good at it. Get good at editing. The, the, best video, uh, the best photo editing app that I use is Instagram. I think that Instagram has a great photo editing app. There's always this, this idea generally that, that in order to get good at, at something or to have professional quality something, you have to go out and buy some better stuff. You have to have a better camera, a better app, Adobe, a fancy laptop and everything. I rarely go on, the, on my laptop. Everything's on the iPhone. So my, my first advice, I am gonna create more videos about specific, sp specific strategies inside of Instagram. Um, so like things like hashtags and, and time to post and, and, and stuff like that. But for this first one, let me tell you sort of a funny story. I wanted to, I wanted to have good photos because I realized that's what made people come onto your, onto your page and consume your content. Um, and I didn't consider myself a professional photographer. So what I did was I went on, on Instagram and I found some photography pages that they did like um, competitions where, where you could use their hashtag and then some people inside of the hashtag or the group or whatever would adjudicate and decide who was the winner. So I basically started taking a bunch of photos and uploading them to these pages. And I started winning some of them. And so at, at the point where I started winning some of, of these uh, competitions, which was just a shout out, like there was no monetary value, but the, the, what I was trying to achieve was with zero dollars could I get professional quality photos. And in order to do that, I needed to have what I considered to be this photographer's eye. So I started taking different pictures from different angles and I started messing around with, with uh, editing and figuring out how to edit photos. And then I started uploading those photos. And I didn't win at first, it took me a while. But eventually I started winning some of these, these competitions or these, these um, photography co contests, whatever you call it. And so at that point I, I felt like, well, I don't have to go out and hire a photographer because uh, apparently I have the eye. Like photographers are judging that I'm the winner of this week's competition. So. You know, like you, you, get, you get what I'm saying. So start getting better at it. Um, start taking more photos. Generally speaking, the thing that I would say is whatever the prototypical shot is, don't take that one. It's not eye-catching enough. So generally speaking, you stand in front of the object and you put it right center in the screen and you take the picture right dead on. And because people have been looking at those pictures their entire lives, they're not necessarily um, eye-catching, and unless the thing in there is really eye-catching. Take one from the side, take one down low, take one up high, put it on the fish uh, uh, lens, like do some less lighting in front and more lighting behind. When you first start off on Instagram, I guess there's always like this concern that you might screw up and, and, and mess up the entire thing. And the reality is you can just kind of do a whole lot of things to test it out. You can always delete a post, you can always try again, you can always start over. So first thing, just get good at taking pictures and then video is sort of a natural extension of, of that. And then we can get into editing and how fast and how not. The, the general um, pattern for consumption or the general demand for consumption right now is quick micro content. People don't wanna sit and watch long, long videos unless it's really compelling. I've had some successful, very long videos. I've got one, one right now on IGTV that's got over a million views and it's a long video. And I never used to think that people would watch long videos, but the truth is, is pictures, short videos, reels, IGTV stories, they each have their own strategy. All right, so thanks for listening to me ramble for a while. Um, I, I really do hope some of this was, was helpful and look forward to making a few more videos.